Welcome guys, gals, and non-binary pals to this week's episode of Buffy Boys, your weekly review of Buffy the Vampire Slayer from a queer, literary, and feminist perspective. I am one of your hosts, Joel, and with me as always is my sober co-host, Brian. Here we are, Brian. We are talking about episode five of season four of Buffy, Beer Bad. Yeah, huh? Um, so Beer Bad was written by, sorry, directed by David Solomon. He last directed The Prom, um, and it was written by Tracy Forbes. Um... She will later go on to write uh, something blue mm-hmm. and where the wild things are. So take from that what you will. Um, she's Canadian and I couldn't find basically anything else better. So uh, it was first aired on November 2nd, 99. And shall I give you a Buffy on summary? Please do. Okay, great. Like settle in for this lengthy description. Moping over Parker, Buffy takes to hanging out in the bar with poser, posers, E-U-R-S, <laughs> Uh, who are rude to the bar staff, including Xander. Oz is attracted to Veruca. Buffy and her new friends start to devolve. They into Neanderthals. Buffy into a fetchingly monosyllabic cave Buffy. Parker tries to seduce Willow, who mocks him. The barman brewed magic beer. The bar catches fire and cave Buffy saves the day. Jesus Christ. A fetchingly monosyllabic cave Buffy. Is that what you said? Yeah, it sure is. Okay, um, so yeah, um, we'll have to get into talking about this shortly and what is widely considered to be probably the worst episode of Which Buffy. Which I would disagree with, but yeah. I would also disagree with that, but I think it's definitely up there. It's the worst episode of Buffy in ways that the other episodes aren't. It's yeah. unique in the ways yeah. that it's, it's, it's terrible. It's deeply dumb, but it's fun, so... Yeah, but before we do get into talking about this episode in our award-winning bronze banter segment, I would like to talk about a TV show which we watched this weekend, which was good, and mm-hmm. as this episode is not. And that TV show is Feel Good. Yeah, so Feel, Feel Good. good. Yeah, May, I was gonna say May, May Martin. May Martin, I was going to say May West. Um, May Martin, um, Canadian com- comedian, um... She had a bunch of, like, gifts going around for years that everyone loved sharing on Tumblr and stuff. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I can't remember what they were about now, though. Being a lesbian, probably. Except she's not a lesbian. Sorry. She's, uh, she has never specified, she's never specified her sexuality. I was reading. No, so, yeah, I suppose it's one of the, um, thrusts of the TV show as well, Mm. but I I think it would be editorial to suggest a, a gender or a, sex, a sexuality for Mae Martin, but that's kind of the, the, the whole exploration of, of their show, which is um, semi-autobiographical uh, and is very much written by, for, and about queer people. So. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it is airing on Netflix in other countries that aren't Ireland or the UK. Um, in Ireland and the UK, it's airing on Channel 4 OD, or all four these days, right? Yeah, but don't use the app because it's trash. <laughs> it's Here's- actually, it's, it's as good as anything else. It's, it's all bad, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really, really good. I really liked it. Lisa Kudra is in it, so I mean, yeah. I was happy. Lisa Kudra is everything. Um, but we binge it in a, a day, and an evening. An evening, yeah. yeah. If there are six episodes or three minutes long each. Yeah. It was very affecting. It was very, very funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and very authentic in the sense of like, oh, it's funny in the way people are kind of, like a high thing version of how people are funny in real life as opposed to like joke, joke, joke kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. which is funny because she plays the role of a comedian in it, yeah. you know? So it's kind of nice that they kind of cast her, she's cast herself as a comedian and not expected herself to be like incredibly witty in every interaction or written herself to be incredibly witty in every interaction. Yeah, like a comedian casting themselves as a comedian and that not being terrible is a feat in of itself. What I was really shocked at is, at is that like she's comedian in this show, but like, you know, the way comedians are usually very like lighthearted and easygoing. Mm-hmm. She actually is very troubled. Is this a, th- like, you know, is it, uh, are there other comedians who are troubled, who are secretly depressed, uh, alcoholic, or sorry, she's a, a drug addict, um, and... It took me longer than usual to realize you were doing a bit. Okay. Uh, but yeah, no, so one of the, one of the thrusts <laughs> of, oh, a bit, one of the thrusts of it is about addiction, um, inspired, or, you know, based on... Informed. Her, informed, much better way of phrasing it, by May's uh, own history with addiction. And yeah, it's it's quite, like, affecting and well done, and, and it's complex mm-hmm. as, like, a kind of, you know, a lot of those kind of texts, and particularly how she kind of meets her girlfriend, and their kind of interactions, and the various issues that arrive there between her and her parents, who, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It can be very easy to draw simple conclusions or simple heroes and villains or at least a very a very 
obvious narrative arc but i think i actually did a really good job of um portraying how these issues are complex insofar as you can feel like people are distanced from you and i can that can just be one um thread in, in a relationship which can be simultaneously very close and very distant and yeah. you're informed both by your parents actions and your upbringing as well as your own choices and you know she's not and she may not very far off our age either so i oh, think she's, she's with 32 or something like that oh, that's ancient yeah um so I, I think it's interesting in that way uh as well but yeah i i i can't recommend it highly enough kind of it's coming off the back th- of it yeah. yeah thoroughly enjoyable it was like a um less polished more canadian more queer fleabag mm-hmm. kind of esque thing and i'm i'm sure she i'm sure she's like absolutely fed up with hearing fleabag comparisons about her show um but yeah it's really really good really thoroughly recommended um we also watched joker last night which was the worst thing I've seen in so long. A real, a real, a real comparison, a real contrast <sighs> there. It was now, just so bad. So before we get into it, we need to put our credentials on the, on the table here and say that we are not either. We're not obviously intending to slay Joker to this degree just because it won Oscars or, or whatever. It didn't deserve the Oscar it won for best actor. Certainly, no. It just it it, it objectively was just a quite a. a bag and poor film and a very hard to follow in places it was hard to follow it was like head scratchingly ill-conceived at points there were points where just like he was saying things and it was like that just feels very uncomfortable and cringy and um, there's a point where he's talking to a black woman who is a uh, social worker and in the 80s in the 80s and she tells him that like, he tells her that like you know he feels like he doesn't really exist or something and she's like am i have a question for you or some of that, or she has some, she's like, I have some news I have to tell you. And he's like, why aren't you listening to me? And it's like, is this a pastiche of like male privilege? Because people really took it very seriously mm. to be portraying the, the real difficulties of being a man in this day and age. And, you know, disaffected working class men in America. Exactly. Well, yeah. And like, you know, disaffected working class men, real issue for sure. In America, oh yeah. But like, but like not this, presented by this film. Yeah. Absolutely not. It I, was Oh. It was actually quite funny. It was it was almost a satirical experience because there's parts of the film where, for example, like you were on, you were in the middle of doing something on your switch, and I was kind of like describing what was on the screen. I sounded like I was taking the pace. It's like, okay, well now he's pulling his uh, lips up to make himself smile, even though he's clearly sad. Now he's handing it a card that tells people he has a condition in his brain that makes him laugh even when he's sad. Now he's drawing a smile on his face using blood. It was Uh, like my major, major issue with it. Okay, is that like the Joker character is so chaotic and fun and excessive and self-referential and has no. There's no sense of structure to the Joker character. He exists purely as a metaphor for what is uncontrollable and what is unreasonable, and you know what this said was basically like oh actually you know should be really sad for the joker he's actually super sympathetic i was like um okay well if you want to write a character like that you could just look at any character who's ever been written in the whole of time or you could look at this really unique very interesting character of the joker generally um and look at the like you know vast interpretation of it uh, of him as being this like very non-emo uh chaotic element and like that's that's great that's good writing that's unique um yeah and what actually happens to the joker in the film to put him over the edge is actually like it's mostly just a couple of people are rude to him and like that, yeah. yeah yeah childhood trauma of course but that actually doesn't come into it until much later like in terms mm-hmm. of like um like, what pushes him to actually do the yeah, yeah spoiler for a bad film that came out a while ago that everyone's seeing except for us but like early on in the film he does kill some people on the subway because they're rude to him and like beat him up or whatever mm-hmm. but like, all that childhood trauma stuff I and mean, the reveals and the twists because that's actually much later in the film so yeah. it, it, you know people shouldn't be rude obviously there's the whole thing with Robert De Niro being like a talk show host and it's meant to be yeah, a reference yeah. to King of Comedy. Um, and oh, what time was that is? Oh, do you not? It's a, it's a film from the, I want to say 70s. It's one of uh, oh. Robert De Niro's earliest films oh. where he played an up-and-coming comedian. And oh. it, 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 it was similarly like a, um, I'm not going to know enough of a film to articulate this properly, but kind of that kind of very formative film for a lot of people really yeah, examining yeah. you know manhood and society and, oh. and, and and kind of entertainment and all that so it was him coming back you know 40 years later yeah. and now being the guy on the other side of the it's, table it's wild that he also like you know rubbed near obviously having been in taxi driver and the main character in taxi driver agreeing to do this movie which was such a bad rip off of taxi driver 
and misunderstood what Taxi Driver was about, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And the, um, sorry, 1982 was King of Comedy and oh, it was okay. directed by uh, Martin Scorsese. So this is like there specifically meant to be like, a reference. people have made ob- obvious correlations. Sure, of them, course. Yeah. Okay, well, that's enough of that bullshit. Um, let's move on to this new bullshit. Beer bad. Beer bad. This episode, bad. Bad. But I like it. Um, let's talk about the good things in the episode. Yeah. Like, start off with what worked in the episode. Okay, so what start- works in the episode is that it ha- follows a very nice Buffy thing that we've been observing, which is that it does set out its cards on the table in terms of its structure and thematic resonance mm-hmm. it intends for you to engage with. So at the very beginning of the episode, Buffy's in a uh, lecture, or sorry, at the very beginning of the episode, Buffy's having what is very clearly a um, fantasy because she's in a graveyard and like fight techno music comes on and it's like, etc. She's um, uh, fighting vampires very competently, only slightly better than she does usually, which I think is yeah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, suddenly Parker's there and she saves him. And he, he's like, oh, thank you so much, Buffy. I owe you my life. Which is, of course... Um, so, there actually, there's a nice little, like, you know, st- structure there. So, what happens is that um, Buffy then wakes up from this dream, or this fantasy, I suppose. And she's, she's daydreaming. She's in class. She's yeah. daydreaming. She's in a lecture with Maggie Walsh, who is explaining the um, Freudian model, essentially, which is that there, every person's psyche is made up of a an id, an ego, and a superego, as we've spoken about before. The id wants the super, the ego, um, the super. What should you say? The ego. The ego is based on the pleasure principle. It just wants the ego tells the id what it can and can't have in a literal sense, uh-huh. and then the super ego tells it what it should and shouldn't want. Sure, exactly. Great. I mean, like in that way, very good. And the this the idea of the id and the um, you know, wanting th- unreasonable, having unreasonable desires, mm. plays through the episode. Um, so you have Buffy wanting Parker and wanting his affection, even though she knows she can't have it and she shouldn't want it. Yeah. And you have Oz also experiencing some uh, some idish reactions to Veronica. Um, Veruca. Veruca, sorry, so much stupider than Veronica, of course. <laughs> but uh, you also see. Um, so yeah, and even in that in in that dream or the fantasy, Buffy is experiencing that kind of idish desire mm. of just like pure um, comfort uh, yeah, that she she wants to have from 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 Parker. Ab- absolutely, because even when she kind of revisits the fantasy, he turns up with some nice flowers and some Hagen Dazs ice cream. Yeah. He he sure does. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like with that, I'm gonna say you know, um, insane episode, like structurally so messy in other ways. But it does have an underlying um, thematic continuity, which I appreciate. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, it's uh, surprisingly, there's actually quite a bit of plot in the episode because there's three, there's three distinct plots. There's the issue mm-hmm. with Parker and Willow confronting Parker and all that stuff around it. There's the, um, the, the, the actual mystical thing happening in the pub. And then there's also Willow and all this interaction around Veruca, his yeah. growing werewolf attraction to her and all that and um, i suppose we should we should really preface because we're taking this slightly as red but if anyone isn't aware one of the reasons why this episode is so criticized is it's, it's very judgmental and puritanical yeah. around definitely sex and casual sex and stuff but specifically around um alcohol about, about alcohol uh, use yeah. and the reason for this is that it was written specifically to take advantage of funding that was available from an american um, council of some description which drug is, uh, prevention anti-drug prevent yeah. etc some council which would give money to tv shows um that would include a message which would be clearly anti-drug two funny facts about that right which I, i'm probably i'm probably snatching from you but i'm going i'm going i'm going to take one and then you can take the other obvious one okay, okay? so basically I, I was reading about this and i was reading that the premise and there was a number of shows that took advantage about this eeyore different shows to save by the bell Saved by the bell sabrina apparently uh, the teenage witch and they really just had to have a scene that was as straightforward or as simple as someone saying hey do you want a joint no thanks man i, I don't want that that's mm-hmm. all they needed and there's the kid- a looney tunes episode with drugs and it's amazing but really on. oh yeah but um and that's all they needed. Mm-hmm. And they reported that the majority of shows went way overboard with it. And there was like, um, you know, murders. There was, um, you know, car crashes, like sexual assault, all this kind of stuff. There was an episode where like a, 
a neurosurgeon refused to give someone the brain surgery they needed unless they gave the drugs to them that they wanted. They went like completely like melodramatic with it. Uh, and they're like, this is not what we anticipate at all. But did Babylon Five do that? No. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, with your man, um, the guy, uh, the doctor. Oh no, that I, that that's predating unrelated and actually quite a good uh, arc about uh, stimulant abuse. Sure. So um. Yeah, so that's all very funny. And of course, uh, they applied for this and they got rejected <laughs> because this episode was too otherworldly and uh, too unclear in its message, essentially. <laughs> yeah. which, which I agree, because even at the end... At the very like, end, that might have been... That was filmed after they might have known that they've gotten rejected for the funding. Potentially, okay, yeah, because it really fails to pull it together. <laughs> yeah, because at the very end, uh, Xander says to Buffy, so Buffy, what have we learned here about beer? And Buffy says, it's foamy. And Xander says correct <laughs> um i have another really funny point about that so yeah it's been wide, widely criticized um both for being fucking stupid which it is uh and for being preachy and moralizing both about sex and drug uh, and alcohol uh, use both of which have appeared in the show before with absolutely no uh with with, with a nuanced uh discussion yeah, yeah well not so much alcohol i don't think anyone's really partaking too much in alcohol i think they're having reasonably mild college experiences so far when sure. it comes to alcohol but sex was like you know um there's a thing in season two that happened that i think really covered the ground of the ramifications of sex <laughs> um it was a uh, it was when willow tried to seduce oz yes of course yeah um but importantly it's been widely criticized but todd hurts um, who writes for Christianity Today? <laughs> he actually has used this episode as an uh, as an example of an honest portrayal of the consequences of um, of of, of uh, alcohol and sex. Yeah, so that's, this is these know. are the consequences. Okay, the the, what, the wild thing about this, I know I said we start by talking about the positive things, and I have more positive things to say. I do, but it doesn't even make that clear in the sense that, like, mm-hmm. okay, she she drinks beer and beer is full of carbs as we know but she drinks probably a cup a few too many beers in an on-campus pub with some guys and kind of makes a fool of herself but she do, it's not implied that she is absolutely tanked she makes yeah, it's like yeah. it's the mystical qualities of beer it's, it's that just, make her weird it's she, just like you know don't do it it makes you beer makes you stupid yeah like, okay, cool. and like giles turning up five minutes from the end and saying his anger like how could you be so irresponsible by giving her a beer as like she has died do you know what I mean? Like she had, like this is like the least consequential thing that's happened to her. Like remember when her like her mother's robotic boyfriend like mm-hmm. threw her down a flight of stairs or something like that. Yeah. I do remember that. Um. So okay, other good things about the episode, which I will focus on. Um, it was so bad it distracted me from coronavirus for like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think I think some of the comedy works. I think ex- yeah. uh, I think there are parts with the not- part the part where um Willow ha- think has mistakenly thought that Buffy has gone home and had sex with four men and one and at the same time yes and well his response is oh oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> genuinely funny yeah laughed at that and i think um and like my, my, my personal journey with this um podcast will be the rehabilitation of Xander harris uh, and that mm. arc i think that it does a decent job and these episodes have done a decent job of setting him up as like a likable well-intentioned um, loyal friends, and all they had to do was like take everything away from him, take away all the horrible things he said for no reason. Yeah, um, and there's a whole thing about him being, you know, uh, a townie or someone who is um, essentially from a lower socioeconomic he, background. To yeah, the which I pointed out is a Goodwill Hunting reference in there, or just that whole situation is very Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, they have like the smart boys, the college boys making fun of him, and like the stuff they say. Mm-hmm. It's like it's implied that not that they're that they're speaking nonsense that they think they're saying something very smart, but it actually makes no sense. It's all about like the socioeconomic, like basically that whether this college girl is attracted to Xander is a question of a simple A B relationship matrix dyad, and it's like it just means nothing. Yeah, it honestly means nothing. But like it's meant to like it's meant to be that they actually think they're getting one over on him. It's you know, very what's so funny about people who use language like that is that you you think you're using language more effectively but it's literally the opposite it's if you're speaking like that you are you're using language specifically designed for texts of like you know insider texts mm-hmm. whereby you can like communicate very specific linguistic uh, structures and instead of using that where useful you bring that out into the day-to-day world which is a thing that only pe- hopefully hopefully only men in their 20s do but like just being like 
oh, well, like, you know, if you split the drug, all that bullshit, okay. Um, you're communicating so much less effectively. You yeah. are literally just using stupid, confusing words to explain something badly. Yeah. So here, 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 here's the here's the hard line on it. Okay, we have all we have all that academic jargon in our brain. All that junk is up there. You and I. It's definitely junked up there. Yeah. But go on. It's, it's floating around. But the purpose of language and the purpose of these descriptive terms is to explain things as clearly and as simply and as precisely as as, as possible. Yeah. So when you do use a uh, more complex language, it should always be in a context where you're trying to say something specific mm-hmm. and you don't want to confuse it with a more general term. Yeah. Be uh, that's the only use of it. If you can say something effectively, simply, that is always the better thing to say. And that's the Joel. I mean, is that have we just shot ourselves in the foot? Have we just like destroyed the reason for our podcast existing? No, I think that this kind of like linguistic determinism is is very simply ev- evinced by the philosophical and nihilistic evinced. nature. Yeah, evinced. Is, is evinced a word? Yes. What's it mean? Like it's like evidenced. It's like to show. Oh, is it? I don't know. Okay. Um, no, but like that is actually a value that I specifically think. I, th- I, I think. Yeah, I would agree. That like there's so many shows that or so many properties that mis mis misrepresent complexity as value in of itself. Yeah. And what I think is ironic, not ironic, uh, but what I think <laughs> is uh, I'm being trained here. This funny. Pavlovian. What I think is interesting and funny is that if you take Maggie Walsh's lecture. Um, she's meant to be a hard ass, do the reading beforehand, mm-hmm. ex- uh, advanced, keep up with her, etc. This is a few weeks in the term, and she's like, the is, the <laughs> ego. <laughs> she, she, like, People sure. want comfort, food, hunger, and they never forget that. It's yeah. Like, yeah, great. People want food, picture a burger. Like, this is the heart, <laughs> this is the, the, the genius level of intellect that we're competing against. Yeah. yeah. You know what, actually, it's specifically the opposite. That whole thing, it's so heavily tied into that American TV obsession with the alternative to that being like, can I get that in English? You yeah, know, yeah. Poindexter. And it's just like, I mean, language, use language appropriate in every situation. Um, and like fuck off. That the, the, the villain of this episode is the bar ten, the bar owner. Yes. Who spikes these drinks. So anyway, okay, specifically she was spiked and yeah. they were all spiked. So anyway, um, and, is is the idea that she is getting unfortunately also spiked because they keep buying her drinks kind of thing, and he keeps serving them the, this like tainted beer? Like, it, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of plot thing plot here. Mm-hmm. Why is why is he only serving this black frost tainted beer to this particular group? Um, black frost. I, black frost. Frost. Okay. Guy. Um, the guys are portrayed as assholes, but they are kind of they aren't actually being weird to Buffy. Like, I know it's kind of set up as, like, they're... One they're, of them is the jerk who's mean to Xander. Yes, one of them absolutely is the jerk, but it's set up that they're going to be creepy to her. And yeah. that doesn't actually happen. Yeah, yeah. And definitely not before they start turning into cavemen. So, so they're kind of the victims of it as well. Yeah, that, I mean, like, you know, the def- there's, there's no amount of, like, you know, slagging bartenders that <laughs> deserves being, like reverted to cavemen and there's no implied consequence for the for the bar owner like that's so true surely off he loses his bar in fairness yeah but like like he when zanger finds him out he's very casual about it i, I was waiting for him to be like well now that i've told you i can't let you leave he just kind of laughs and zanger leaves and that's the end of his side of the story mm-hmm. it's it's very very strange um and then it's the other side of it is okay this whole thing don't drink beer because the worst thing you can do in college is drink beer mm-hmm. um but Oh, do you know that like no college students under the age of twenty one in America drink beer? None yeah, of them. I know this is this this was a this revelatory mm-hmm. uh, scene for them. But uh, the the other side of it is this whole issue around Parker. And I mean, the more we get on with it, I'm, the more I'm like, this hasn't aged well from Buffy's perspective. It's like you had casual sex with someone; he's not interested in you afterwards. Maybe leave it at that. Yeah, like there's there's definitely the the show canonically inserts the fact that he is kind of just you know he doesn't necessarily believe everything he's saying he is using as a way to get girls and that he tries to seduce willow etc beyond that Mm -hmm. beyond what the show tells us is objectively within his universe true what he's saying it does actually make a lot of sense and i know that's probably the slightly unsympathetic thing to say but a lot of what he says to willow is just that you know Having sex with someone doesn't mean you want to marry them. Yeah, but he says it, and he says it, he doesn't say it harshly. He's basically just like Will is like, well, in- intimacy means friendship, respect, and that you will be with me, or not with me necessarily, but 
you know, there'll be a deeper connection there. And he's yeah. like, well, can some people, you know, some relationships are like that, but sometimes people can come together for a positive thing that they both enjoy and that's just it. And I'm sorry if I hurt Buffy's feelings. Now, that may be a little disingenuous because he doesn't quite mean it, but he's not wrong in what he's saying. And the extent to which she is like hammering him over it and then Buffy, you know, Cave Buffy wants to kind of kill him a little mm-hmm. bit, I think is far, far excessive in terms of, you yeah. know, as you said, aging well for the show. Yeah. So, um, come here. One of the uh, one of the the four college boys who I said, "Oh, you, do you recognize him?" So I didn't recognize him. I looked him up. What's that for? What do you mean? I said I, I'll tell you about it. Okay, so I didn't look him up. Oh, okay, cool. That's Cal Penn anyway, who was in House. Uh, he um, I, I and Harold and Kumar. He's Kumar. Those movies. But he's in house. He is. I can't remember his name now in it, though. To be honest, but I remember spoiler for house season five or something. But like in seasons three, one to three of house, he has like a team of three, uh, re or assistants with him, and they kind of make up his like staff, and it's a real nice dynamic. And then after season three, they all like break apart, and he has to get new ones because they are now um fully, um they're full doctors, whatever. Mm. And he basically goes through like a huge rigorous like. Uh, audition process for different people um one of the one of them is um olivia or you're one who directed um book smart recently i know he made olivia wild olivia wild i want to say um and she plays 13 who's a bisexual woman with huntington disease which is whatever or hunter's disease i can't remember anyway but another one is this guy um and very very shockingly got written out of the show with no warning because he kills himself and i was really like what the fuck so i just like wake up one morning and they're like yeah he hanged himself what the fuck did anyone know that anything was going on and they tried to spin it into a message of oh you just can't tell what's going on with people whereas in fact the actor basically got uh, recruited to join the obama campaign or the obama administration maybe okay but yeah that's that's insane yeah that's wild it is wild it was I, I I used to watch House as it came out um, because I was 16, so mm-hmm. that's my only defense. But I remember when that episode came out, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and just like scoured online for just like answers, inter- like internal answers around the show, around like, was this like portrayed pre- previously? Am, have I, did I miss something yeah. huge here? And no, it was just a programming note, basically. Is, it, is this what started your deep root fear of missing details in televisual programs? Uh, no, that came from X Men animated series. I used to watch it when I was younger, but I'd always miss episodes and not realize it. And just things would be happening, I'd find it so confusing and so scary. And it was a very scary TV show anyway. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say that gave me my fear of missing information. Well, I was a kid when we used to rent DVDs from uh, Extra Vision. Uh, me and my mom rented the Three Musketeers film. Uh, it was one of those weird DVDs. I don't know if you remember it, but it used to be that, like, they could only fit one half of the film on one side of the DVD disc, so you had to flip it halfway through. Yeah, we had we have some of the, some of those that had like the the letterbox on one side and the white screen on the other side and yeah. stuff like this. It's yeah. crazy, but I didn't realize this, so I put it in. And I just thought the film started like a media res, <laughs> and then we watched an hour of it. And I was like, "What the fuck, hell? <laughs> it's over!" And then we went back and watched the Starek, so we kind of had a bit of a reverse uh, yeah. memento experience with it. That's that's amazing. Um. I, I mean, yeah, so I did some reading around this episode, or I tried to, and no one writes about this episode, of course, because mm-hmm. it's a throwaway nonsense episode. Um, did you read about uh, what Joss Whedon's reaction to the episode was? No, tell me. So um, when they got the script about an hour before shooting, he came to David Solomon, the director, and he was like, yeah, this is not good. I am not happy with this. And he was like, his line that I, I took down that I thought was very funny was that he said, um, I tried to make it better, but all I did was make it funnier. <laughs> and I don't think he meant funnier in like the way of like high level comedy. Um, but David Solomon and Joss Whedon over the years have actually defended the episode quite well. Um, they've often said that, you know, while uh, there are definitely bad episodes of Buffy, that there's always like notes of like good writing and notes of good portrayals and good messaging throughout. I think this episode does have a really deeply stupid um central premise central premise and approach uh but yeah i would agree there's definitely no notes of like good writing um i think for the most part the characters are speaking in somewhat the right voice willow wasn't at all 
for some reason, Alison Hannigan just completely missed the mark this week on, on how to portray Willow. Yeah. Which is a very, a very, <laughs> I feel very bad at saying as just like, you know, some guy in like 2020 being like, Alison Hannigan did a very good job yeah. on this episode of this TV show, portraying her own character in 1999. Yeah. But still. But even though, so it's a bit where she's, she's completely removed from the supernatural plot for that week, right? And then she makes a point to Parker about how, Parker just wants to have sex with her and mm-hmm. how men have been like this since the dawn of time and then the four cavemen burst into the room and she turns and sees this and she turns back to Parker and says see what I mean just that, like, does, that would not happen that doesn't make any sense yeah exactly so what Willow says in that situation is something like you know just like something noting how bizarrely yeah. literal that or she looks scared and she says oh, I didn't mean like that or something but she looked yeah. she looked unconcerned shortly before she was knocked out yeah you know? yeah sure um yeah or you know you tie into her magic you make her feel like for a second oh did I accidentally yeah. cast a spell exactly you yeah. know anything like that um let's start to wrap up because ooh, I don't want to talk about this episode anymore sure. I liked it um, well enough but anyway my, my, my question is before we wrap up on mm-hmm. the episode is what's a worse episode Okay, I would say the swim team episode. Go fish. Go fish. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say I Robot Eugene is worse overall. Um, I much prefer I Robot. No, sorry. I, I really like I Robot Eugene to watch. I think it's good fun. But yeah, I think this is this is definitely yeah. I've heard that one um, that people criticize a lot is some assembly required. Yes. Which is the Frankenstein footballer. Uh, I'm mostly episode. fine with it as an episode. You know, I don't hate it. I'm gonna stick with Go Fish. Yeah, I think That's Go Fish. aged poorly for me, even since we recorded the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Another one that people often mention is Double Meat Palace. But I think when we get to that, we're going to find that quite fun as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's do the dusting. Buffy bits. Can I throw a couple at you? Hit me. Okay. I've actually used up a couple of them already, to be honest. Um, oh, yeah, there's an Ash song in the background at, the, at one point in the episode. Um, do you remember Ash? Not very well, though. No. Okay, I actually loved, loved, loved Ash as a band when I was younger. Um, they're from Northern Ireland. I want to say Kilpatrick, something like that. Um, but they're really good. Um, one of their songs won the Ivor Novello Prize one year, which is basically the best song in the British Isles. Like so it's a songwriting prize. Um, another song that won that was a Villagers song, actually, which was also really good. But it was for Shining Light, which was a really good song. I um, actually just really like Ash, to be honest. I mm. listen to them still sometimes. Um, it's basically like 16-year-old songs sung by men in their mid-30s. Oh, yeah. This episode was nominated for an Emmy Award, a primetime Emmy Award for hairstyling. <laughs> so that's one of the most embarrassing things I've ever heard. Um, oh, yeah, actually. here's It's less of a fact and more one that we could have discussed in the episode, but uh, Mark Fields suggests that this season has a theme of identity theft or being robbed of your identity, and not in a, like, kind of um, modern sense, but in a, you know, losing your identity yeah. kind of way. So this episode, Buffy does lose her identity, and she regresses. Um, and I just really liked the phrase, um, nothing can defeat the penis. I thought that was very appropriate. Which Xander bellows at one point. Yeah, a very appropriate phrase to come from a horror TV show. Oh, yeah, and we also saw... Uh, Nicholas Brendan's tattoo for a second in this episode, which was unusual. Yeah, either a tattoo on his bicep, kind of like what we only saw it briefly, right, like yeah. almost like a tribal kind of thing potentially. Yeah, and it was only just slightly creeping down, and I don't remember seeing it in Go Fish, so I presume it's happened since then. Yeah, and I, I tried to catch it in other scenes in the episode, but it just wasn't. Well it might positioned. have been a stunt double, but not see, a stunt double, but like you know, a body double because you know with those re- shot reverse shot things they often get the body double stand in because it's easier and it's less expensive sure i just feel like you'd be more careful about continuity like that with a, a stand in yeah oh my last note um is uh, at one point the all the college boys are talking and they're being completely up themselves and one of them says there will be no thomas aquinas talk at this table <laughs> yeah. and you know what joel i think that could be the phrase that for this for this podcast because there will be absolutely no thomas aquinas talk at this table that brings you back to college shutting down thomas aquinas conversations mm-hmm uh, so a couple of notes I had was that um, I mentioned this in a previous episode, but we actually can still see Buffy's scar on her neck. Yeah, that was uh, nice. From the, the two vampire bikes she's had, uh, which I quite liked. Uh, and also, strangely, they specifically refer to this, um, I believe, never seen again venue as the on-campus pub. And mm. It has a Welsh flag in it. It did. That was unusual. Um, but no other British trappings, <laughs> as far as I could tell. Um are there people in America who'd like like to claim to be Welsh in the same way they like to claim to be Mar- to, to Irish? It can't possibly be. Yeah. 
I th- I will I will wager. My grandparents are from Clan Glanog. I see. This is it. I will wager that the average American person probably couldn't imitate a Welsh person or wouldn't know what Welsh some yeah. Welsh stereotypes. Fucking lucky Welsh people. At the same time, they voted to to exit the European Union. Sure, so about anymore. I'm, I'm saying like English people, obvious. Yeah. Um, Scottish, Irish people, maybe some outdated stereotypes, but they could have a crack at it. I think Welsh people might actually be a question mark for for a lot of people. Like, so I would have to the, think so. Yeah. Yeah, this area of the world, which is weird. Yep. Because I like Welsh people. Um. Okay. Some uh fashion notes. Uh. Oz is wearing a very nice shearling jacket in this he episode. Is, yeah. I really like it. Um, Buffy's wearing a really bad a top, which has like red in the top, and then a doily yeah, separating like sections. Ribbed again. Awful. Like rib clothing. Yeah. Um, Willow is also wearing an incredibly long maxi dress um, with just, it's just awful looking. It looks like trade Renaissance fair awfulness. Mm-hmm. And uh, Veruca is wearing shoes which make her look like she's wearing tiny stilks while she's she on does, stage, she which, does, we, yeah. which we enjoyed. That's not her singing, by the way. No, I, I, I was about it's to ask called you. THC. It's a band called THC. As in the actual Greek in Canvas. Uh, yeah. Mm. See, I'm cool. I'm with Lol. it. Uh, I know uh, about drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even convince myself there. Um, no, I think uh, the rest of it was just bad caveman fashion like the caveman makeup was i suppose like if you have to do caveman makeup it was fine but it was uh, just but do you have to do caveman it was, makeup? yeah it was just embarrassing and just especially especially with the only southeast asian character you've ever had in the show maybe don't put them in facially deforming uh makeup yeah yeah for the best for yeah. the best uh yeah so i think that's it for for fashion great um death count zero zero yeah no decks and mm. death of death of comedy <laughs> the death, death of, of my respect for yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah absolutely um, and a rating do you have a rating ready to, there Joel I would give this episode probably a probably a four basement candlelit cafes okay go on it's by far the lowest rating you've ever given an episode of Buffy you think that's not true I think so yeah Um, I would probably revise some of those ratings if I <laughs> went back now um, I was, I, I suppose it's kind of this weird um, bias where I was expecting it to be unwatchable. Mm-hmm. Um, for the start of the episode and for some of the, some of the parts that weren't around this, I was like, oh, I'm actually kind of enjoying this. I'm like, I'm, I'm enjoying watching, you know, Oz figure his stuff out. Mm. And, and Buffy, like Sarah Michelle Gellar was quite likable in the, in, in, in the parts where she wasn't like hamstring oh, yeah. by the writing. And she's also like, I mean, fair play to her that she's like, just like more than happy to like, you know, crouch around and pretend to be a cave woman yeah absolutely um but i think it falls far short of the um the quality of the show uh, both in terms of just like as something fun to watch but also just in terms of the the strong messaging it generally has and uh, it's, it's slightly anti-feminist see i'm not sure if I me- i'm not sure if i mentioned it since we started recording but i think it might actually fail the bechdel test which is very yeah, unusual you didn't say that, yeah it's very unusual for a Buffy episode because there's very few interactions between women in the episode between willow and buffy and they're almost all everyone i can think of is about parker yeah and willow um also is obsessed with another woman stealing her man not yeah great. it's just not great like, i think xander actually comes off the best in this entire episode yeah, yeah. which is like tell, saying something i'm gonna give this episode 5.3 hours out of 10 i actually <laughs> think it's like more good than bad in terms of enjoyment factor i just think that it's maybe lacking obviously all the problems that exist with it exist with it mm-hmm. but it's grand you know, sure. I actually I have no hatred in my heart for beer bad. Okay, so we we've healed some wounds here today. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, should we do the Cordelia chase? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Room with the view. Yeah, so you want to take it away there, Brian? Room with the view. And um, so yeah, this week's episode was Room with a View. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty decent. Pretty decent. Yeah, I would say. Um, Probably the best episode so far. Probably the best episode so far. I think it's the episode that establishes that w- works the formula they're trying to do. Where again, it was, um, you know, there's like shady dealings, there's a uh, demon mobsters, but primarily it's that like Cordelia is living in comparative poverty now and she gets a really nice apartment, which Doyle sex her up with, but the apartment turns out to be really nice because it gets haunted. And then there's a thing that Angel actually does quite a bit, which is nice bait, nice bait and switch, where initially you feel that. The, the, the poltergeist there and it's because that the mother was killed by the son but it's actually like the, the mother who is the um spark emotion from donnie darko i am um, i question you wait what was it um 
I'm question your commitment to I'm beginning motion. to question your commitment yeah. to sparkle motion. That she's woman. in lots of things, Oliver. She's in loads of things. Yeah. Uh, she's a mother. She actually bricked her son up on the wall because he was going to run away with his fiance, and then she's harassing Cordelia, calling her a whore, etc. Yeah. So I think one of the really great elements of the episode is that um, it focuses on Cordelia, who is by far yeah. the most fascinating and brilliant character in the show. Focuses specifically on her. It focuses on her basically being the bitch's back, Queen Queen Cordelia, um, and kind Quincy. of... Queen C, sorry, and fighting her off. Um, some weird notes in that, uh, you know, I don't know if this is for the benefit of people who haven't seen Buffy, but Doyle asks Angel about who was Cordelia beforehand. I was like, yeah. oh, Angel is like, oh, Cordelia, she ruled the school. Uh, she had a, a group <laughs> He has girl. a real, like, you know, like, wistful little speech about her. Like, yeah. Cordelia had everything, everything she ever wanted. You can just, you can just picture him, like descending into like an animated uh or like you know very roughly hand animated like storytelling yeah, yeah, yeah. pictures being like you know um and then ev- one day she lost everything and then like you know the, and then the, she, the stick figure falls <laughs> the stick figure falls and then the the flipping the flipping book kind of like comes to a close and it's the end of her story and yeah, yeah. anyway he talked like, about the cordex and all this kind of stuff so it was, it was, i think that's the first use of the word cordets in the Buffy verse, which is interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% if that's the case, but it could be. I think me. Um, but yeah, so everyone was kind of in their own voice. Um, and it's just like, yeah, it's a fun little kind of mystery kind of thing happening. And yeah. um, there's nothing nothing wrong with it. Um, it gets a little awkward because, just looking back now, because they're trying to lay early seeds of um, Angel being like, Doyle, I'll do you this favor, but one day you'll have to tell me about your life because obviously you've got a dark past. And he's like, maybe I will one day. And I was like, oh, two episodes from now, tell me your entire past with your father because you're going to die. Like, yeah. that's what happens yeah. um, because he gets written out. Um, but no, I, I, I like it. I like that episode. Uh, I think it's up there for me in terms of definitely like the good seasons. Of I Angel. also just like poltergeists generally um, in terms of just their uh, mythological elements. I think they're cool. Yeah. There's a really weird element to it though where she's nearly strangled by the poltergeist and then the guys come she's over like, they try to she tries to fake her her own, her suicide so this poltergeist tries to show pretend like yeah. um Cordelia's, like killed herself and just like ha- like hangs her yeah it's very very upsetting but then the, the gang come over to welcome her to her apartment and she wants to hide the problems because she doesn't want to lose the apartment yeah so she's immediately like nothing's wrong here and, and catching scissors out of the air as okay yeah. those are slightly different times so when when she's trying to hide it from them it's not after she's just being sa- so saved from hanging herself. Sure. So there actually was a bit with the court earlier in the episode as well before they come in. Oh, was there? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but yes, it does try to actually cause her to kill herself later on. And she has a line where she stands up to the sparkle motion ghost uh, and she says, I'm not some sniveling little cry buffy. Yeah. Uh, which is very good. So yeah, I'd probably give this like six fail feminist gestures. Six? Eight. I was going to give seven fail feminist gestures. That's fine, Joel. That's fine. No, you I can stick with your six. I think I'll stick with six sure. because I think there are better episodes of Angel. Like I, I think, oh yeah. But absolutely. as in, like this is this is good and this is solid. But you know, it does get good, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I want to hold off for that. Yeah, it gets good so briefly though. Really, like it's not Buffy. Let's, it's never going to be Buffy. Riley's never going to be Angel. This is yeah. the Riley of TV shows. <laughs> oh fuck! <laughs> right. Okay, so um, that's gonna be us for this week. I yeah, think yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Um, I feel like it, it's weird that we haven't mentioned coronavirus stuff at all. But you know, listen, you're probably all fed up listening to people I'm, talking I'm about. I'm certainly constantly. fed up with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's 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 happening. If you're listening to this in the future, um, we are in Ireland. We're into week mm, two and a bit of general uh, quarantine as a nation. Um, yeah, it's weird. Are, are, are these so in the future uh, after civilization has ended and there someone's reconstructing uh or what happened from the audio logs are these going to be the audio <laughs> logs they're listening to oh god i hope not they're so full of shit <laughs> yeah but, um if, if you're a futureman um futureman this is all lies <laughs> none yeah. of this is real <laughs> <laughs> please don't please don't base your society around but what we described right? <laughs> please do it'll yeah. be, be only be better than what we have now um, Sunny Dale, but on the moon. <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay, so we're going to let you go. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate your 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 you being here with us. And we appreciate your you. ears. We appreciate your fears. Your ears. Your ears as well. Yeah. Um, and if we will see you, what's next? Episode? Next week for uh, Wild at Heart. We will see you next week for uh, our next episode, Wild at Heart. Uh, but until then, tell your friends, tell your bartender, uh, 
stay safe, have a good week, and we will see you next time on Buffy Boys. Why is that always your go to when I don't when I don't chime in? I don't know, it feels safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye guys. See ya. Slant. See ya.